All right, Luke 12. Luke 12 is where we're going to be. Uh, we're going to be continuing our s- study of the Gospel of Luke. I'll give you a few moments to turn there. Luke 12, verse 22 to 34. Maybe you notice if you've been tracking along, we uh, may- maybe you're thinking we skipped over the passage, that parable just before that. J.D. actually preached on that a few weeks ago during our capital campaign. So we're going to be picking up in verse 22. Uh, and we'll go all the way down to 34. This is what God has to say to us this morning. And he, being Jesus, said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are able not, if you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not seek what you're about to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is God's word. Uh, It is not every morning that you get to hear someone preaching about a subject in which they are a world-class expert, but you're in luck This morning, that's exactly what's happening. I mean, just a few minutes before the sermon, okay? Nothing's more humbling than having to practice slow breathing techniques while fidgeting, you know, while singing a song before you go up and preach a sermon on worry and anxiety, okay? I'm anxious about the sermon on anxiety that I'm about to preach, all right? I know public speaking is kind of a fear for a lot of us, and so you may have thought, well, maybe he just you know, doesn't really struggle with it like, you know, I would. You know, it's been a few years now. I mean, he's been doing this for a while. He's surely he's gotten used to it. All of those are good points, but that's not exactly true, okay? Still difficult, right? Maybe I just love the pain or something. I'm not sure. But I'm not the only one, of course. I know I'm not the only expert. If it takes, if it's true that it takes 10,000 hours, you know, you know, in a certain field to be considered an expert, maybe we're not at that number yet, but every year, you know, we log a couple hundred hours, and we, get, we, we, we do this a lot, which when you think about it is really crazy. Consider, you know, you'd think that because we do this, because we worry so much, that we would really see what Jesus, one of the things that Jesus says here, that it doesn't do you any good. Like worrying doesn't add an hour to your life. Why would you do it? You'd think that all of the time that we spend worrying, we'd finally learn, and we'd stop doing it, and we'd put it off, but no, every year, every month, every week, we put in our fair share of worry. And I know you've heard the statistics about anxiety, okay, about how in the last 20 years, we've seen seen an increase in anxiety in our society like we've never seen before in in history. And I'm not going to, you know, tell you all the, the numbers and all the details, just to know that our society really does wrestle with this in a way that we, we never have. Those are the the clinical numbers that you've probably heard about, the the anxiety disorders that we would clinically label. But that's not to even consider the the worries that we all face, you know, throughout our days. Just the the general, you know, day-to-day, what's going to happen tomorrow. To varying degrees, it's a big problem for all of us, worry. So we can expect then that the scriptures are going to have something to say about this problem that comprehensively we, we all struggle with. And thankfully, praise God, we have a wealth of of passages, of direct 
application for our worries and indirect application for our worries. And this passage this morning is probably one of the most famous. The counterpart of this is in Matthew 6. Maybe you're more familiar with that. But because there's much to say about this, because this is a, a very you know, heavy conversation for a lot of us today, there's a lot of people that have a lot of different advice for how to handle worry. And a lot of those things are really great things that we need to pay attention to and listen to and use as we wrestle and, and, and battle our worry. Others give us unhelpful advice that only contribute and add to the problem that we face. But what is the biblical approach to worry? What does Jesus have to say about our worries, particularly in this passage? It is a very big topic, okay? There's no way we can, t we would have to have like, you know, a sermon series or a you know, two-day seminar to talk about all of the things. But as, as far as this passage goes, Jesus says two things about how we can approach worry. We need to realize first that we need to rethink or reassess what we value and we need to rethink or reassess our relationship with our Heavenly Father. So value and relationship, okay? First, we need to rethink uh, what it is that we value, okay? The first thing that Jesus tells us, I think, in, in verses 22 to 28, we can pretty, see pretty clearly, is he tells us that we have a very big value assessment problem, okay? We're really bad appraisers. We all have some longing. I mean, we feel this, but also Scripture tells us what this is. We have a longing in our souls for something to satisfy it. We all do. And really, you can boil it down to two things. We're all looking for significance and security. And of course, thankfully, the Bible and God offers us that very thing, the thing that our soul is longing for. He promises that in him, you can find significance. He, he will clothe you in his righteousness, and you can be known and loved in a way that surpasses all understanding, give you that kind of peace, knowing that you are known by the God of the universe. And he offers security, of course. He gives us e eternal security that our souls are longing for. All of the things that we look to for security, like you know, improving our health or you know, good alarm system, all of that stuff just, uh, in, uh, you know, Set, puts off the inevitable, just delays it a little bit. But only in God do we have some security that lasts us through death. So that's what God offers us to our souls. It's what we find in a relationship with him, and that's great. But again, we have a value assessment problem. Even though that's true, we look to things in this world to kind of fill that void that we're looking for, to, to take the place that God, only God can give us, to fix that problem that we feel. And so we look to things. and we. So Jesus has to all the time remind us of things, like, like he does in verse 22 and 23. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food. Okay? Life is more than that. The body is more than clothing. This is what he's saying. He's just making a bad judgment Really, your anxiety is, is a symptom of bad judgment, okay? Your worry is just a symptom of bad judgment, ultimately. But that's not how we process our worry. We would think about our worry as really just an emotion that comes about because of the uncertainties of tomorrow. I can't really control my kids. I can't really control uh, my bank account. So what we do is we sort of blame our worries on the fact that we can't control those things. I wouldn't worry this much if I had more control over this, if I knew that this was going to be there. And so we work and we do things so that we can make the uncertainties more certain. But again, Jesus is saying, ultimately, what's going on is much deeper. You don't worry because you're not omnipotent. Don't blame your worry on lack of control in the future. Blame it on your heart. Because worry is an emotion. Here's what we need to see. Worry is an emotion that is intimately connected to our deepest desires. We see, seek his kingdom first. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Worry is intimately connected to our deepest desires. And this is what I think we're supposed to see in verses 22 to 28. And I want to get more to more about what I'm about to say. I want to get more in this in the next point. But just really br briefly, 
I want us to be aware of something. There is a belief that your emotions are directly tied to your thoughts. And that when you're experiencing negative emotions, it's all because you're thinking about something wrongly. You're believing a lie, so you're experiencing a negative emotion. And because it's foundationally your emotions built on you know, believing a lie, just take, take those emotions, take those feelings, ball them up and throw them in the trash, all right? Now, there's a good bit of truth there. There's a good bit of helpful stuff. But I'm going to talk about this later a little bit more. But I want to suggest not to necessarily just immediately dismiss those, those feelings and emotions, but rather use them and, and pay attention to them and ask questions. I've heard it said before that emotions are pretty good barometers for what's really going on, what we really value, what we really treasure. It's like helpful data that reveal, reveals what we really care about, what we really value. So be curious about those emotions. Why am I feeling this way? Why is it that every time my kid you know, goes off and does this or that, I you know, seize up? Maybe it's because I have an unhealthy obsession you know, with my kids. Why is it that I can't, to use an example that Jesus says, why is it that I can't leave the house unless I look like this or I'm, I'm wearing this? We value what we, we worry about what we value most, where our treasure is. And I want to say, you know, this is a very difficult subject, okay? Because we have to ask the question, like, where do we, where do we draw the line on a lot of these things? Like, it's hard because so easy to kind of bring up a, a very, very easy excuse. Well, obviously I care about, I'll, I'll just use myself as an example because I've already brought myself up. Like, and I, this, I just realized this, so this isn't in my notes. Bear with me. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll wing it, all right? It's hard for me to differentiate between caring about a sermon and at what point is my anxiety because I'm, I'm overvaluing things I shouldn't. And so I'm sitting there wrestling with this thing and I have to ask myself deep questions. You know, because yes, you're right. It is good to worry about, obviously, God you know, ha having a sermon that's faithful to the, to the scriptures and presenting something to all of us that's clear and helpful. I mean, it's good to, to think and c be concerned about that. But it's hard for us to, like, differentiate where the worry kind of crosses the line. You see that, right? Because if I'm really honest, a huge part of the reason I'm fidgeting and nervous and have to practice breathing is not because I'm worried about being faithful to the text. I've already got all the stuff. It's written there, except for this. <laughs> But it's, I'm really worried about what you're going to think of me. I'm really worried what you're going to say about the job that I did. Now, I trust that God's going to speak through me. I get that. I'm, I'm not so concerned. I'm just concerned about what you think. So it's hard for us to really divide when we care about our families or we care about providing for ourselves and our families. Like, at what point does our anxiety become something because we're valuing other things? Sinfully, wrongfully. But the argument that Jesus is trying to make, that life is more than that. I mean, you're ascribing value to something that's far more than it should be. So you're saying to yourself, a lot of times, your worries because you say, if I could just get there with my wardrobe, if I could just get there with my bank account or my children's grades, whatever it is that's causing you to worry, if I could just get there, I'd be okay. So really, ultimately, our worry is a symptom of covetousness, I think is one of the points that Jesus is trying to make. So let's just think about this a little bit more through one specific application, okay? There are a lot of different things we can worry about, as we've already kind of mentioned, but let's just think about it through one topic, money. I think it's the big one, and I think it's the reason that Jesus kind of chose it here. If you're worrying or overvaluing things like money and placing on its, and, and giving it a place in your life that Fill, you're trying to fill that void of security and significance, what's going to happen is that thing is going to consume you. You're going to be thinking about money. How can I use it? How can I spend it? What can I do to make sure it grows properly and not use it, not lose it, and all that stuff? And Jesus is saying, wait, 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 don't, don't do that, okay? Wait a second. In this passage, he says, have you considered the ravens? Well, not recently. I mean... Maybe the Baltimore Ravens, I've thought about them a little bit, but not the Ravens in particular. He says, think about them. They don't have any savings, and yet 
They never seem to lack. Consider the lilies. They don't worry about adorning themselves, but they're beautiful because God clothes them. And what Jesus is doing is something pretty interesting with money. Okay? He's, he's addressing two types of people. In the illustration with the ravens or the crow, he's saying they don't worry about saving their resources for tomorrow or keeping all of their resources for themselves. And then he says with the lilies, they don't worry about using all their resources to clothe themselves. God provides. So he's addressing the, the saver and the spender, right? For some people, money is their sense of security. So they're like the rich man in the parable just before, if you're familiar with it. They get a surplus, and it's going straight into some investment account. You know, they find $1,000 on the ground, you know, get a big bonus, and they put it straight into the bank. They're still shopping at, you know, the thrift store and the dollar menu and skimping in every way they can. For other people, money is their source of beauty and significance. And so when they get a bonus, they spend it. They upgrade their wardrobe or, or their car. They go on vacation. And of course, because opposites attract a lot of time in marriage, these people find themselves and it's really easy to deal with. Yeah. Both, but the interesting thing is both, both person thinks the other person has a money problem. But Jesus is saying, no, you both do. There's two kinds of foolishness. The one who worries about securing their future by hoarding their wealth and the one who worries about buying their significance with beauty. One's, who, one's preoccupied over the abundance he has and the other over the deficiency that he fears. And in verse 31, he says to both, instead seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Allow God to deliver on his promises. Seek his kingdom first to be the primary source of your security and significance, that eternal thing that you're looking for. Seek his kingdom, value him above all else, because when you do that, you won't have a reason to worry because he comes through on his promises. There's no greater security, there's no greater significance that we can find in a relationship with Christ. This is not to say, of course, all of this, that we shouldn't save, or that we should only wear clothes that we think make us look ugly. That's not what this passage is saying, of course. But it's when you look to those things, those second things, and make them first things, to give you the things that it never was able to, was never promised to do, of course you're going to worry. Of course it's natural to worry. And a lot of the reason we do worry is because that's exactly what we're doing. We're doing. I was talking with a friend the other day about this subject, and he brought up a book that he was reading. I think it was called America the Anxious. Uh, in, the, uh, in it, the author states, paradoxically, the pursuit of happiness is the very thing that is making us unhappy and anxious. The top three reasons for anxiety, just generally, in American society, physical security, money, and health. Isn't it ironic then that we live in a country that simultaneously has more anxiety than any culture in history and also more prosperity, better health care system, more security than ever before, than any civilization before? So it's futile. When you're worrying, a lot of times it's because we're doing this very thing. We're believing things can give us what it was never meant to do. We overvalue things. We have an assessment problem. Last thing on this point, okay? Not only do we wrongly value things, not only do we overvalue things, but we undervalue ourselves. When we're anxious, we're revealing to the world a distrust in God. You're living as if there's a possibility that God may not have me. So I want to say one more thing about the ravens, because I think there's a few reasons that Jesus chose ravens or crows to use in this illustration instead of uh, uh, some other bird, okay? Because what, what are crows really? Uh, really, they're just, you know, rats with wings is a good way to think of it, right? Nobody has a pet raven. Uh, nobody goes bird watching for ravens, okay? You see an eagle, and it's like this majestic thing. You want to take a picture of it, and it's really you tell your friend about it. You saw, saw an eagle, it's right over there. You see crows and you want to shoo them away from the dead carcass, you know, that they're chewing on, right? 
Leviticus gives us a passage. It tells us that they're unclean animals, just flying rats. And yet God feeds them. Verse 24, of how much more value are you than the birds? We are the only beings in all of God's creation that have the opportunity to call him father because we're, we bear his image. And so when we're worrying, we're declaring to the world that I'm not valuable. I'm not worth God's care. I don't think he will look after me. So consider the ravens. Let them preach to you. We overvalue things and we undervalue things. Now, I know what a lot of you are probably thinking. Uh, so, Drew, what you're saying is all I need to do is think differently about what I value. All I need to do is think differently about these things that I'm valuing, and I'm just going to stop having anxiety. That's just it. That's the key. You have no idea what it's like to wrestle with the things that I'm dealing with right now, the things that I'm worrying over. You, don't, you have no, no idea what it's like. I'm glad if that's you and you're thinking that. I'm glad you're thinking that, okay, because we don't only get something to rethink uh, values. We also have to see something about a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Look again at verses 29 to 32. Jesus says, And do not seek what you're about to eat and what you're to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay, maybe this is a helpful way to think about this. I've been reading a few chapters in a book called Logic of the Body by Matt Lapine. Uh, in it, he explains that there are two ways that people typically deal with, or two, two camps in which people typically deal with anxiety and, different, anxiety and worry in different ways. So we can think about one, one stream as the theological stream, okay? This group or this thought is the idea that your negative emotions, kind of what we talked about earlier, your negative emotions reveal a distrust in God full stop. That's it. So the mind, again, is the engine driving the emotions. And because that's the case, all you need to do, you just need to think differently. And at the end of the day, here's the big, here's the big part I want us to see that this group says. At the end of the day, your emotions are voluntary. Okay? Your emotions are voluntary because you can control what you believe. You can, you can control your thoughts. And then there's this other group that says, it's, we can sort of say it's like the contemporary psychology stream. This labels all feelings and emotions as simply your body's response to certain circumstances. It's just simply your body responding to certain stimuli. So the body, in this understanding, is the, is the engine driving your feelings. And so in this view, you can't really do anything. Emotions are something that just happen to you, not something you will to occur. So there's not much you can do because you can't control your circumstances in the future. You can't, you're not in control of those things. They just happen to you. So you can't control your emotions, okay? The best thing you can do is self-care, uh, improve your diet, medication, things like that. But you can't really control the future, you can't really control your emotions, okay? Two big different ways. One, you're fully culpable and you can control it. The other, you're not and you can't control it. In the, in the book, though, the author laments something I think is, is key. For so long, people have had to choose between the two to the exclusion of the other. It's either this way or that way. And so I want us to see what is God, what is Jesus saying here? Is that how, how Jesus handles this? Okay, so look at the very first statement. What does he say? Do not be anxious. All right? Now, what does he, no, but what does he really mean there? Okay? Is he saying do not be anxious as, as if it's a command? Like, oh, you're worrying, well, just stop. Just stop worrying. I mean, why would you worry? Just stop doing it. Or is he saying it, or is he meaning it in a more consoling way? Like, oh, you're worrying, they're there. That stinks, I'm sorry, you can't really do much about it. They're there. Which way is he meaning it? It's a difficult question, but do you see how it's a pretty important question as we're dealing with this passage? Is it possible, and I think the answer is yes, it's a rhetorical question. 
is it possible that this is perfectly ambiguous for a reason? That Jesus doesn't mean when he says, do not be anxious, just suck it up. And he doesn't mean to say, when you're anxious, they're, they're there, there's nothing you can really do about it. No. It must be both. Look at what he says. Don't be anxious. You have little faith, right, on the one hand. And then he says, don't be anxious. Fear not, little flock. Is your father's good purpose to give you the kingdom. He knows your desire. He knows what you're going through. So how, how I think about it, maybe a helpful way to think about it is, there's a difference between me asking you to pass the carrots. Okay, that's something you can do. You can hand me the carrots. We're at the table. Just pass me the carrots. You have co control over that. And there's a difference between me saying, hey, can you go grow me some carrots, right? I mean, yeah, you can do things, make sure the temperature is right and the good soil, but there's just certain things you don't have a lot of control over. But there's a difference in an expectation, I think, between this directive of do not worry and a difference between do not steal, okay? This is something that we're all going to varying degrees have to wrestle with our whole life. And I feel, feel comfortable saying this because I do not want to let us off the hook. I'm really afraid of that. Us just walking away and saying, well, there's nothing I can do. I don't want to let us off the hook. I feel comfortable saying that most of your worry and anxiety is rooted in sin and distrust in God. But we have to realize that sometimes in certain situations it's not. We have to have grace for that. Um, let me give you an example. A few years ago on one of our trips to Italy, a student came with us. Uh, she was great. She, you know, very intelligent, uh, you know, well-adjusted socially, intellectually, all of that. But she had one massive fear. Anytime she looked at him or anytime she even thought about it, she would just be paralyzed. Do you know what it was? Escalators, okay? I think it's, it's okay to chuckle a little bit, right? There's sometimes, I mean, if you're afraid about clowns, like I get that, that those are terrifying. If you're afraid about pancakes, I'm sorry. It's just a little humorous, you have to admit, right? And there was an instance where one time on the metro station, she, we had to go down the train, and the only option was the, the escalators. And uh, for some reason, they didn't have stairs, and the elevator was in, in repair. So there's a group of about 10 of us, and we didn't have much time left before the, the trains stopped running. Uh, but there was nothing we could do. She was in tears. She couldn't move. She was paralyzed. Finally, she agrees to go down, and I'm standing on, you know, the step behind her. Jim Davis is right there on the step. Angela's in front of her. We form this, like, human shield of, you know, uh, while we're going down the escalators. And, of course, it is uh, she's probably in the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest escalator. I mean, the whole time, like two minutes, we're going down this escalator, this poor girl's sobbing. Now, what if I treated her situation, especially as a pastor, and I just said, look, suck it up. I mean, you're, this is a ridiculous fear. Nothing's going to happen to you. Come on, get it together. And I just threw her on my shoulders and, and, and took her down the escalator. Do you think she would have conquered her fear of escalators? That would have helped? No. And here's the reason I don't feel necessarily too bad about chuckling about it is, and I've talked to her about this, like she knows, she already has it in her mind that it's a ridiculous fear. She knows that nothing's going to happen to her. That part's not the issue. She gets that. But when she was younger, she had two accidents down escalators before she was at the age of seven. One of them left her hospitalized and permanently damaged. So of course she's going to work. Of course you can't just turn it off. So we have to realize this. It's not easy sometimes. There are a lot of times when because of our past or because of lack of sleep, we're just worried or irritated the other ways that the bodies can affect our emotion. That's not always something we can just turn off the next day. And when we get Jesus, everything goes away. Because if we don't realize that, if we don't deal with ourselves that way, and if we don't deal with other people, what we're going to do is we're not going to treat the issue biblically, and we're, not, and we're going to bring in a, t a ton of shame. And when people feel that type of shame, they don't feel more driven towards God. They feel pushed away from him. I mean, this is how you feel with your father. 
Do you feel a cert, a shame about a certain issue in your life? Do you feel like your father's going to shame you? You come to him with a problem. Are you more or less motivated to go to him? This is how it is with our heavenly father. He doesn't shame us. He doesn't do that thing that we all do, or at least I do. He doesn't say, oh, you want to spend this much on a dress? Have you considered the starving children in Africa? <laughs> it's not the move that he makes. And let me say, valid point. It's good to put things in perspective. But that's not the way that we see him deal with us in this passage. He says, fear not, little flock. Your father's intimately aware. I understand it's not easy for you because, yeah, you grew up in this way. Your whole life, you've, your value system has been about seeking the approval of others. And it's going to take some time for that worry and that value system to flip. This is also not how he deals with the people of Israel in the passage from Exodus that Rihanna read, read from earlier. What happens in that passage? The people groan, okay? They say, God, why didn't you just leave us in Egypt and kill us there? At least we had food, right? Now you're just bringing us out here to, to die and starve. And this is one of those times where I just, I, you know, it's easy to laugh and think how foolish these people are. I mean, they just witnessed all of these plagues, miraculous plagues. They just saw the Red Sea parting and being delivered out of slavery. And they're, they really think that God's just going to bring them out there to die of starvation. How could they not see that? Of course, they were supposed to see that. They're supposed to trust God because they've done all those things. But we do the same thing too. Your thought is, well, I know God can take care of me. I know he's done all those things. But there's no way Jesus knows what it's like for me to struggle with an eating disorder. Throw in whatever worry it is for you. When you see the cross, when you turn your eyes to Jesus, what we're supposed to see is the fact that God has taken care of our greatest problem. He's taken our sin and put it on himself and his son Jesus, and he's paid that penalty so that we now don't have to face the just and infinite wrath of God, and we can be reconciled to our heavenly father for eternity, and we can find that sense of security and significance in him. And if that's true, and because it is true, when you turn your eyes to the cross and look at him, you'll realize that, of course, he can take care of whatever struggles I'm facing on this, this earth. Of course he's going to see me through. But the Israelites grumble. Notice what God does, though. Okay? In this passage, it doesn't say how foolish you people are. I don't know if y'all noticed this when we read from it earlier. He says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. You're, you're hungry, here's what I'm going to do. Each day I will make it rain bread. I'm going to bring manna so that you go out every single day and take what you need. But there was one rule. God's trying to teach them about his faithfulness. There's one rule. They could not do what we all would do. If you were like us in that situation, really hungry, and thought, well, you know, I may need a little bit more tomorrow you know, or, or for tomorrow, because it may not, we may not have a rainy manna day, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get what I need, store up what I need to have enough for tomorrow, maybe even the next day. I says, don't, don't do that, because what God is trying to teach them is that not only will you have trouble tomorrow. See, God doesn't say, how about I just not make you hungry anymore? He says, I'm going to give you that, that trouble is going to be there but I'm also going to be there. Your worry, the thing that you're worried about, yes, you will be thinking about a thousand things today, about what could possibly happen in the future. And, and the good news is 999 of them will not, but something will. And God says to the people of Israel and to us, not only are your troubles going to be there, but he will as well. You know, this is a good thing about seeking the kingdom of God. This, this is why I love what Jesus tells us to do here. Because seeking his kingdom is not just something we need to rethink. It's not just like rewiring our brain. 
seeking his kingdom, because his kingdom is marked by his presence. Jesus came in and ushered in the kingdom of God. He says in another passage of Luke that he himself is the kingdom. And so when we're seeking first his kingdom, we're not just thinking about something differently. We're getting a new reality, something very real. We're, we're being given his spirit to work through these various struggles in our sin. Yes, you'll have trouble. Speak to any Christian that's been a believer for a while. Every single one of them will say, yes, I was worried about that, and that's exactly what happened. But also Jesus was there, and he was enough. God gave me exactly what I needed. There was manna. It was enough for me. So whatever you're worried about, it probably won't happen. Something will, but God will give us enough. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that um, we thank you that all of our problems, in fact, hardly any of our problems, we are left to our own devices, but you give us something much greater than anything we currently possess. We don't have a strong mind. We don't always turn our eyes upon you, but you have given us your son. You've given us your spirit. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us this week to see some of the things that you've taught us in this passage. To not be worried about worrying, but to turn our eyes to you and remember the glorious news of this relationship that we have. It's not just an intellectual change, but you've given us your spirit. So thank you for this time. And I pray as we sing this final song that you would allow us to meditate on it. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.